back to another episode of our Uncovering Possibilities content series sponsored by the Texas Career Engagement Office. I'm joined by Dr. J.D. Burnett, University of Texas. Hey. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional work. Yeah, so I am just here at the end of my first year at UT as the Director of Choral Activities. Um, I moved here from Athens, Georgia, where I was on the faculty at UGA for nine years when worked with uh, four choirs there. Uh, I t conduct one choir here, it's the Concert Chorale, and I, um, I lead the graduate program in choral conducting and teach uh, repertoire classes. Wonderful. Yep. Tell us a little bit about the professional and community ensembles that you work with as well. Right now, I'm the artistic director for two professional chamber choirs. One is one that I have uh, founded uh, about 15 years ago now in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, that has since re-headquartered to Atlanta. And so that's Canara. Uh, and, and we do about a four or five program concert series each year. And then more recently, I became the artistic director of um, Orpheus Chamber Singers in Dallas, which is uh, in some ways a similar organization, a professional chamber choir, uh, does about the same amount of work each year. Um, and I just last week finished my sixth project with them. So between UT and these two professional uh, chamber choirs, uh, my plate's pretty full. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with both of these organizations? Yeah. So I'll talk about Canara first. I went to Westminster Choir College when I was a master's student, and that's in Princeton, New Jersey. And I spent a year after that in California uh, in an interim director of choral activities position at, at San Jose State. And then when I moved back to New Jersey the following year, there was a small kind of recently graduated group of singers who were interest, from Westminster who were interested in continuing to sing together. And at that time, I think it was about eight or 10 singers. And it had sort of started, uh, got some momentum while I was in California and they were kind of doing their thing. And then um, when I got back, they had sort of decided that they needed some external leadership. So uh, they, were, they were sort of sharing responsibilities and of leading the rehearsals and the concerts. And I, um, I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. And so, uh, so began my work with Kanara. And for about two years, it was a volunteer choir. And uh, eventually we started taking donations at the door when we do concerts and we started throwing people gas money. And then we got incorporated and formed a board of directors and were able to start paying singers more. And then eventually about four years ago, we decided to make the intentional move from Princeton to Atlanta, which is a city that uh, knows and loves great choral music uh, still the um, legacy of Robert Shaw looms mm. large in that city, mm -hmm. and and people uh, support choral music a lot there. So that's how I got involved with Canara, and I've enjoyed steering that for the last 15 years. Orpheus is something more recent. Um, I lived in Dallas when I did my doctorate. I went to UNT for my doctorate, and I always knew of the work of Orpheus that was led by my predecessor, Don Crable, its founding artistic director, for 26 years, I think. Wow. And so I had been to a few concerts while I was in Dallas uh, as a student and um, always thought, boy, if I ever could lead that group, I would really like to do that. And so sure enough, uh, Don Crable decided to um, retire from Morpheus and they did a national search uh, in 2020, of course, in the middle of the, the mess. Um, and I was uh, uh, appointed designate artistic director in 2021 and assumed um, the helm of Orpheus in January of 2022. So it sounds like these two ensembles, although they're, they're very similar, your level of involvement from, you know, starting almost nearly from the beginning to something that's way more fleshed out and present in the community is really different. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I feel like because of my work with Kanara, uh, I have a really uh, kind of unique sensibility about what it's like to be a founding artistic director. And so um, I, you know, as I took over for a founding artistic director. I felt like that was something I wanted to be sensitive to. Right. Um, and to continue the great work of somebody who uh, who led the ensemble for so long. So while the organizations are similar, my level of um, attachment to them is obviously different. Although uh, just in about a year and a half, I've grown very fond of Orpheus. Right. Um, although Canara will always be in a, a special form of my baby. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, since you were able to see Canara almost from inception to where it is now, um, what sorts of growing pains did you guys go through or, or what are different challenges that you've had and how have you proceeded through those? Yeah, that's a great question and one that was actually the subject of a, a case study at Eastman about cholera. Oh. Yeah, it began with a dissertation by my friend Kyle Nielsen and then uh, was published in a case study thing at Eastman. So 
Kenora is interesting because it began as a volunteer organization and then eventually became pro, like I said a few minutes ago. And um, it was, it took root in Princeton, which is a small town. It's actually a very small city in the corridor between New York and Philadelphia that was already served at the time, this is 2008, by the American Boy Choir and Princeton Pro Musica and the Princeton Singers, another professional choir and the only choir college in the world, you know? And so the, the landscape was saturated with choral music. So many groups over the years, you know, kind of sprung up and then didn't survive. And fortunately, Kanara has. But the biggest struggle for us was how to make a go of it financially in an already saturated market uh, in central New Jersey, where a million choirs were at, our dis at anyone's disposal, or if they wanted to just hop on the road and go north or south an hour, they could be in Philadelphia or New York, where everything's uh, present. So one of the things that precipitated our move to Atlanta was that we saw a city that was underserved by professional choral singing, and that was Atlanta. Uh, not underserved at all by volunteer singing, but by there was no resident professional chamber choir. And so uh, we have tried to meet that that need. And so the, the challenge for us has, tr has pretty consistently been financial, like so many of these uh, 501c3 nonprofits. It's all about creating a following and developing an audience base and developing a donor base and future board members and people who can help you perpetuate the work that you're doing. And so that's been the biggest struggle for Canara. It's been true also for Orpheus um, in a different way in a different city. Um, the two big kind of qualifying differences between Canara and uh, and Orpheus at the moment artistically is that the singers from Canara come from all over the place, all over the United States. Um, we have a beautiful core of local professional singers that um, that work with us regularly, but we augment that with um, singers from all over the country who do this on a semi or quite professionally full-time basis. Um, in Dallas, our singers are all North Texans. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's the Metroplex in Dallas, as you as you know, is, is rich with talent and, and it's a beautiful art scene. And so it's easy to, to populate a professional chamber choir with local talent. And I, I like that sort of articulation between the two groups. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, you were mentioning donor base and understanding your community and connecting with the audience. Can you just sort of talk about things that you've learned or, or that have specifically helped you to foster that? Because but not surprisingly, that's been a common link between the, the different folks that we've spoken to. Oh, working with community music. Yeah, of course. I mean, and it's true. It's true whether it's a professional organization or not. And we can talk about that in a minute. But there are people in in our line of work that or and some of my colleagues for whom fundraising is apparently at least easy, you know? And uh, maybe it's because they're positioned in a nice way that, that allows them to interface with people with resources more readily. For me, you know, I've always been in this kind of little art lane, you know, and my positions, uh, outside of professional choral work have always been academic. So um, whether it was when I was teaching high school or uh, now at university, the constituencies are different in some cases. And so for me, I've had to learn um, how to develop really intentional and specific relationships that aren't necessarily like buddy-buddy all the time, but ones that just develop trust, you know, um, where someone who loves the art can say, wow, this this person um, shares my values in some way, you know, whether they're musical or personal or whatever they might be. And I trust this person in terms of what they're able to bring to the table musically and artistically and, you know, the qualities with which they lead. And so, you know, that's that's been where I've been able to find the moderate success that I have in terms of fundraising is by developing those relationships and put out into the ether someone can resonate with um, on a lot of different levels. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be about me. And in, in fact, I'm like way more interested when it's not. When it's about my colleagues, it's, it's about the music, it's, it's about the community that results from our work. But I, like it or not, am often the face of that. And so it is sort of built into my job to help curate fundraising, a development, uh, an, an outreach and a growth uh, vein we can use to further our work. Absolutely. Do your programming practices and choices about um, repertoire and whatnot, how much of that is influenced by yourself, by the ensemble, by the community, and how does that ecosystem exist? It's kind of all of that. I'd say it's mostly me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just 
I'd be lying if I said that I didn't often program saying, hey, I'd really like to do this and then build a program around it. I think that's pretty common. But there are things that, you know, are interesting to presenters. So for, uh, for instance, uh, a model that of production that Canara uses is that we are often presented by existing concert series. So instead of selling our own tickets and taking the box office revenues, we are um, have historically, at least in Atlanta, been presented and then paid fees to appear and, and that sort of thing. So sometimes there's something that is of interest to a presenter. You know, otherwise it's it's a confluence of my interests and those of my close associates with Canara. And s similarly in, in Dallas. Looking at Canara specifically, sort of the transformation from the very beginnings to the gas money, to the incorporation, to the, can you, for folks that are wrestling with those yeah. same questions or, or want to be at that finish line, and I know that of course the work is never done, what sorts of advice and guidance would you give them that look at that with really envy and admiration? Yeah, so with, for me, can, having confessed to the fact that I kind of live in the music lane, I knew that I needed to surround myself with people who could help me accomplish the things that I wanted to do. And for me, with Canara in 2008, it meant putting together a board of directors who have specific talent sets and experience. And so I was fortunate to assemble an, an inaugural board had expertise like our the, our first president of the board was a former marketing director for m m Mars so he had marketing wow. expertise our our treasurer was someone who was recently re retired from prudential and on down the line attorneys and uh, real estate agents people who knew the community so basically it was an effort to try to gain the support through the generosity of these board folks who were willing to serve as a just extending my network and to fill in the, like the many gaping gaps, I guess that's a bad kind of sequence of words, but uh, huge cavernous gaps of knowledge about how the business side of things work. Right. Yeah. So I would I would just advise people to do the same. Surround yourself with people who know more than you. Mm. What skills, artistic and otherwise, do you feel best serve you in your work with your professional ensembles as well as with your uh, work at UT? I've been asked this before, um, and I think you know. Whether it's musical or not, like the things that, that I guess apply most consistently across the board are leadership qualities. I think somebody coined the term one time situational leadership. I don't know if that's something that everybody kind of knows what that is, but it, at its most, most kind of base level, it's um, just kind of being able to s survey a scenario and accurately sort of diagnose like what does this scenario require of me and the struggle for that for me and i suspect for a lot of people is like through those questions that, that kind of question like how you learn a lot about yourself and how can i provide what's needed without violating any of my personal standards you know uh, my values how can i do this in a way that conforms to my values but that borrows from a wide palette of available personality traits that i have because i can be very introverted and I can be very extroverted. Both are authentic, you know? It's just like certain times require certain things. And I use that as just one example. But just being able to to kind of determine what is needed of me in this moment and what version of myself, my authentic self, can I apply to try to yield the results that, that I would like to see come? And so I would say leadership is probably the biggest part of, of that that has applied across the board at, in academia and in professional choral singing, and in all the community work that I've done uh, prior to, to this. Absolutely. In fact, let's just double back to that really quick, yeah. because I'd love to love to hear more about that. Can you sort of share your experience? I know that you've done a lot of guest conducting and whatnot in a variety of contexts. So can you talk about maybe some of the differences between community music and professional music and how, how those skills may, may differ or be the same? One of the things that I've tried to to shape in my artistic life is like that I could at any moment kind of pivot between any level of music making. And I've been able to do that fairly well at the top level and at the beginning level. I'm, I have the least experience with like very young musicians, but that's always been valuable to me because I feel like it balances me in a certain way. And so everybody needs the same thing. They just need it in different proportions, you know? So I, I'm always a teacher. I'm always a conductor, you know? I'm always an educator, I'm always an artist. And it just, it, you know, it's just finding the right combo of those things in a given situation that yields the kind of results that, you know, you desire. And so aside from that, I think that the biggest differences in community or volunteer organizations are people's motivations for being there. Some people come to a community organization for the community. Some come for the community and the art. Some come for only the music, you know, 
and and you've got a, a, a wide variety and you're inside that constituency to try to meet, you know, and try to uh, fulfill and provide for. And I like that. I, I have always enjoyed that a lot. And I, I feel like Robert Shaw always said that music should at its heart always be an amateur endeavor, you know, those, the lovers of it and from which the word amateur comes. And if we can serve that in people uh, at every juncture or the best we can, then, you know, then you can do great things. I think otherwise they share a lot of the same struggles. They share the fundraising struggle. Now their revenue streams differ significantly a lot of the time, right? There are a lot of granting organizations that like to give money to programs that are cultivating amateur musicians. There are a lot of opportunities inside of volunteer organizations to be connected to the community in, in a way that a professional choir can't exactly. And just there's just such a wide, like, wide-reaching kind of tentacles of um, folks who are involved in the community, choirs, for instance, who connect to the city that they're in or the community that they're in. They come from all walks of life. And and so, you know, building a house for a concert for them is a different task slightly than for a professional choir, and in some ways easier for a community organization than a professional one. Those nuances are are, are many, but there's a lot of overlap in, inside what's the struggle for nonprofits across the board. Um, but I've always enjoyed, you know, working with the many community choirs, Houston Masterworks Chorus, the Masterworks Chorus of New Jersey, the Young Men's Chorus of New Jersey. Um, at UGA, we had a town and gown choir on that met on Monday nights. It was a, a meeting place for undergraduates and graduates and faculty and emeritus faculty and, and, and members of the surrounding Athens community. And so, you know, that's just such a rich experience. And I've, I, I'm not doing a lot of that right now, but at UT, I, I foresee that there might be a place for that too in the future. So a lot of different ways to do the same type of work, but you know, it's all, it's all an endeavor of bringing people together. I mean, it really seems like all of those ensembles that you were talking about as well are just a great way for folks that have music in their life every day, really through school and through being in high school, band, orchestra, choir, mariachi, jazz band, et cetera, for a way to, for them to keep music in their lives. Yeah, and that's the thing is, um, I always, I, I say this when I go out with the UT choirs to do recruitment tours to high schools and stuff, that I feel like when I taught high school, which I did for five years, I, I feel like maybe one of the things that I didn't do well enough was to keep encouraging them to sing after high school, to just to know, hey, there's if you're going to college, there's a, there's a choir for you, you know, You've learned so much. Keep doing it. It's something that can bring you joy your entire life. And there aren't very many things like that. You know, there's a church choir. There's a community choir after that. If you get tired of singing, but you still love music, be a board member, be a volunteer, buy season tickets, you know, help to perpetuate the arts because of uh, the impact it had on you as a young person. I wish I had done a better job of that when I taught high school. So you mentioned, you know, the importance of leadership skills through all of your work with community music. Can you tell us a little bit about more how you cultivated those skills? Yeah. And, and I've always been interested in, in, in teams and group endeavors. I grew up at the United States Military Academy at West Point. My dad was a college football coach. And so I think I couldn't possibly have escaped an experience of like leadership awareness and team building, you know, uh, community building group effort that probably just inculcated in me in an early age and, and began to develop a, an interest in and an admiration for beautiful leadership and having seen examples of really great leadership and really not great leadership. And then as an adult, well, as a student, and then as, as an adult, like just, I happen to have had just a, a, a whole litany, like a sequence of really fantastic mentors, really like a, an embarrassment of riches. And I've been able to watch them work and, and see what it is that makes them so successful and try to try that costume on myself so you're, well, how does that feel natural in my body how is it how is it effective in my personality what can i borrow from what is my instinct telling me whatever instinct is by the time you're an adult you know cuz you're not totally divorced from outside influence and then you know just finding my own voice inside of that i you know whoever it was that said artists borrow great artists steal whatever yes it is, you know it's admiring certain things in certain people and then saying, oh, how can I, how can I use that in my own work? And in an authentic way, so I'm not copying somebody, you know, it's sometimes a challenge too, but yeah, I don't know. I, I have always been interested in that and I've always, you know, just been an observer. Yeah. I always tell the undergraduate students and graduate students, I was like, 
you no matter what your degree is, if you want to go out there and be a music teacher or if you want to lead an ensemble, if you want to be a conductor, you learn the most by singing in the choir, playing in the in the ensemble, right? You learn the most by being there every day with your butt in the chair, you know, just watching. And if you are some sort, if you just like man, manage somehow to let four years of an undergraduate experience slip by because you've just been blithely sitting in the chair and been inactive, um, it's, it's a squandered opportunity because there are so many things that can be learned just by watching. And you don't have to sit there and agree with everything. You know, you can sit there and be like, okay, what's, what's she going to do next up there? Uh, why did he do that? Oh man, that worked. Ah, that wouldn't have been my priority. Oh boy, I'm, I would not do that. You know, it's, it's just an activity inside of you so that you're not just sitting there being a passive receptor the entire time. Right. You know, having agency in your own education by, by being an engaged um, observer. That's, and I think that's where I've learned most. This is, this is so wonderful. So you've already given us so many pieces of advice and, and wisdom and, and things to think about. So our podcast, our content series is called Uncovering Possibilities. It's really for folks, graduate students and postdocs that are considering opportunities in academia, but also potentially more of a portfolio career that would include work out in the community or with professional ensembles or any other professional endeavors outside of academia. So do you have any last words of wisdom for folks that are listening that you'd like to share? Don't be scared to do it wrong. You know, whatever choice you make is kind of the right choice at the time. Because even if you get a year down the road and you realize, boy, this situation is not for me, you can course correct. You know, you can you can find a different pathway from there. And that doesn't mean that that year of your of your experience is lost. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge and wisdom gained from being in situations that are uncomfortable. And so don't don't worry about making the wrong decision. Make a decision that you feel as, as you kind of accumulate a career. Make a decision that you feel good about. You know, that you feel serves your values, that allows you to be authentic to yourself and look for opportunities to stay balanced, you know, work with young, young musicians, work with the best musicians you can find, you know, work with new ones, work with the seasoned ones and know that, you know, as much as you're trying to get it right, right in that moment, you're trying to be the right thing in the moment. You yourself are constantly a work of art, a work in progress, not necessarily a work of art yet. <laughs> but like a work in progress, you know, we're all work, we're all works in progress. And if there's, you can appreciate that and just doggedly pursue what you think is right in the moment. I think the richness lies somewhere there. Thank you so much for taking some time to speak with us. Thanks for inviting me.